Great to have you back on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. First major conversation for today takes us back to, you know, going, you know, deeper and, you know, trying to understand better, uh, you know, with regards to what happened in Ikoyi uh, not very long ago, a few days ago, actually. Um, and, of course, uh, seeing the response from the Lagos State Government. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, there were on record 44 people confirmed dead. We're speaking this morning with Isaac Idoko, his uh, HSE manager for Industry Safe Management Company here in Lagos. Good morning, Mr. Idoko. Thanks for joining us. Hello, good morning. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on the program. The conversation really is to understand better uh, how we could maybe have saved more lives at the Ikoyi uh, disaster. Um, we've spoken, of course, with other people who have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, expressed their opinions with regards, uh, you know, the responsibility of the Lagos State Government, uh, you know, to those people who were victims of that disaster. Um, but, of course, you know, as Nigerians, we understand how we normally act, you know, as long as the government has, you know, said that all is well and, you know, we, we, we go back to sleep. Uh, but we've chosen to continue and keep the conversation going. So I, I want you to share your thoughts concerning the things that you saw, if you watch, if you saw the video clips from the search and rescue operations, the things that you saw that you maybe thought were inadequate or completely wrong. Okay, thank you for this um, question. Um, before I continue, I would like to say, uh, to send my condolences and on behalf of my company to the families of those that have lost some um, their loved ones in the cause of this some um, tragic incidents. Um, may their souls rest in peace. Also, I would like to um, send my um, sympathy to those that have lost all forms of um, resources, both humans and materials in the cause of this incident. So um, sincerely, like you rightly said, um, in the cause of this rescue mission, like every other one that have happened in the past. We've seen a lot of lapses. We've seen a lot of things that were never meant to be. And um, in each, as a nation in Nigeria, I think um, one may be forced to conclude that we are a nation that is largely driven by emotions. And one thing with emotion is that it is highly active, but temporal, okay, uh, very, very short-lived. This has happened not once, not twice, not thrice. You can recall that in 2014, we had incidents with a church guest where over 100 people died. Um, in 2016, we had the building collapse in Lekki where a lot of people died. And even this year alone, we've had a couple of, um, 2020 to this year alone, we've had a couple of other collapses um, in Korodu and other places within Lagos and other parts of Nigeria. So what should we have done differently, learning from the past and learning from history? Um, first of all, one of the things that I've um, discovered in the course of this particular operation is um, lack of immediate response on the part of our emergency responders. Because when an incident of this mag magnitude happened, ha happens, rather, you have a very, very high chance of rescuing a lot of people alive when you venture into your duty immediately. And I would like to even use the um, just one example of what happened in Miami recently, um, I think about four months ago, where a building collapsed in um, at the Florida um, seaside, the pool side. That incident happened by 1.30 a.m., around 1.30 to 2 a.m. And immediately emergency responders were on site and started work, started rescue operations and all. So there were high chances of being able to rescue a lot of people alive because where these people are underneath them, these bricks, these rubbles and all these things, they have limited access to oxygen. They have limited access to, um, to air, to breathe. And also coupled with the danger of dust and even the cement itself, because when you work in cement factories, you're exposed to a lot of dangers that you don't even need to breathe with your um, the normal breath outside, you're meant to put on a mask that filters yeah. some of these um, vapors outside. So you see, when this is not done immediately, you now expose these people to more danger. So you expose them, you they can easily die, and then the one you're just doing after a day, two, three days is just anyone whose God says your time has not come. But 
on a normal and professional level following standard operating procedure. Immediately that happens because when that incident happened, I think for over four hours, our emergency responders were nowhere to be found. We learned they may be hold up on the road or no one knows. Even the few people that were rescued alive immediately, if not for guys um, around and neighbors and um, maybe other people around that had to go in there, try to get some people alive, maybe we would have had more casualties than what we currently have. Okay, so um, you know that uh, there are different types of um, emergency. Now, for the case of a building collapse, as is with us in Lagos, Nigeria, Koyu to be precise, what type of equipment is required? What kind of instruments do we need them to show up with? Because you've talked about the fact that they need to show up, uh, but what kind of equipment do they need to show up with? Good. Thank you so much for this question. Now, when there's a building collapse, it depends on the, on the type of building and the environment. But some of the equipment that you need to show up with on site includes the excavators, the cranes. Because when you're trying to make a rescue operation, there are different types of operations. We have the, the shoring, which has to do with building a temporary, um, a temporary uh, steps in order for you to have easy access to the particular place. Then we have the lifting and uh, moving, where in the case of when you look at the mode of um, uh, the, the building, the Koyi building, you see that they are more or less the blocks and the, uh, all the concretes are stuck together. Yeah. So in this kind of case, when you want to make quick rescue, you need things like the, the cranes that can easily be used in lifting and moving. Also, we need equipment for uh, breaking and then uh, breaking and breaching. So when this happens, some of these equipment are the things that should go on site. But in the case of Ikoyi, what we saw was only the excavators. And that further aggravates the issues. Because in fact, as a, as a matter of fact, when you look at what happened in Ikoyi, you discover that most of these operations is more of retrieval and recovery um, re, uh, mission rather than rescue. Because the excavators, all it just does is to just go in with the um, with the rent and then try to pull down the, the rubbles, the concrete and all. And in the process, in fact, we have some that, um, we have some recorded cases that the excavators disembarked um, some of the people, some of the victims. So what that means is the person may be alive, but on, at the collision with the excavators, you realize that the person would no longer have any chance of um, surviving. So some of these equipment, because the kind of building, the kind of environment, and the kind of operation you would like to carry out depend, um, that would determine the type of equipment that you go on in with. But it's not at all time that you would only use the um, excavators, because like that Ikoi zone, there, there are high chances that if you do um, lifting and moving using um, cranes and some of these heavy machines, it would have been easier to, um, to rescue some of these victims. Do you think that we could have worked faster, you know, with regards to Koyi? Um, it, it took about a week, you know, maybe more than a week before they eventually then declared that search and rescue was over. Do you think we could have worked faster if we, if we were serious about actual search and rescue, not recovery, like you've mentioned? Uh, could we have done better Absolutely with time? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely, yes. In fact, one of the issues that um, happened, or uh, that keeps happening is the issue of employees' competence, all right? Um, we keep saying that when you leave your employees without having proper and requisite skills and, um, and the knowledge about certain operations, when it plays out, maybe your family may actually be, um, or friends, close friends may be the victim of your inefficiencies. We should have responded faster. And also, even at that, at the time we responded, a lot of things happened, a lot of negative things happened. Part of which was one, you know, the, the, the guys that came on site, I don't think if they have shifts, I don't think if they have batches, but we learned at a point they had to stop work for um, almost seven hours. This is because these guys also that are working, they are not provided with the right um, PPEs, personal protective equipment. As a matter of fact, I, I, I am a field professional, and I, look at, and I looked at some of the hazards they, they were putting on. When you look at them, I don't think some of them are made of high-density polyethylene that can withstand pressure tests. And when this happens, 
when employees are given inferior items to take um, to um, sites to work, knowing fully well that that may not give them maximum protection, what happens is their confidence level will be low and their marginal productivity to labor will be low. Because even in as much as we are trying to rescue other people, you don't also want to be a victim. So we should have acted very, very fast. And also the, the, the emergency responders led by an incident commander, they are meant to have shifts because you can't be on rescue mission and then you leave work for hours saying that you're going on break or whatsoever that happens. As people are going on break, other people are meant to venture into work, into the rescue uh, mission. As others are leaving, more people are coming. So we should have acted faster and better to save more lives in this case. All right. So another case or another issue or that was also raised is the fact that um, the issue of manpower, the fact that they were on the staff and we could see uh, members, relative or family members, soliciting that they should be recruited in the entire search and rescue and, you know, those who were around. Do you think, um, uh, you know, that should have been done uh, being that they don't have the necessary training. Absolutely, yes. I do agree with that because, you know, when you have a loved one there, you would even want to jump in and try to save their lives. And truly, they are understaffed. Like I said, that is why I did mention that these guys are meant to be on shifts and they are meant to be in batches. So if it's shift one, you can have batch one, two, three. All right. So that once you work for certain hours, because as a matter of fact, apart from like I did mention about the equipment that they are exposed to, if you're working in that place, as these excavators keep working and bringing out these dust, the rubbles and the concretes, these guys tend to inhale dust and all manner of things. And the mask I saw them with basically are just the, um, the laboratory mask, the normal COVID-19 masks that every other person are putting on. This cannot protect you against these dangers, these vapors and um, this dust that comes out of that place. What that also does is it's, um, it makes the, the staff on duty, the, the emergency responders on duty to easily wear out while working. So they are understaffed, which is, the best, which is um, a major problem. And not just that, the wounds that are on ground do not have the required equipment and PPEs, materials to work with in order for them to put in their maximum um, productivity. So yes, I think our emergency um, system needs to do more and not just recruiting anybody. They need those that have passion for rescue. They need those that have passion to devote themselves to this because all we see around now is um, when you know someone that knows someone, when there's a, um, a vacancy, you get filled in. But when the time to perform comes, because most of our institutions, really, that is what happens. And that is why whenever there is an incident, whenever there is an issue, whenever there is a problem, you see the, the real competent, competent people that are meant to um, do the right job are not to be found. But you, mentioned, giving the little they can. But, but you mentioned that uh, before the emergency, I mean, the, the Lagos State Emergency Management actually arrived, uh, it was through the help of those who were around neighbors that were able to, I mean, because of their proactiveness, that's why we were able to rescue the persons that we uh, were able to rescue alive. So, um, I mean, how do we now explain the fact that yes, people need to get you know the right training at that point in time. Let's not forget that it's an emergency and then you begin to look for who's got the right training. Yes, um, you know, <laughs> one thing in HSA is you cannot try to solve one problem and create the other. Because when you look at the, um, the, the hierarchy, right, of safety, when you, when you are in any environment, the first thing you need to do is to eliminate hazard, all right, to eliminate hazard. Then if total elimination is not possible, you have to substitute the hazard with the lesser one. If that is not also possible, you have to create an engineering control. If after engineering control, you go to administrative control and then you come to the PPEs. Now, the guys on, on duty and the neighbors and the likes, they were able to rescue few people. That is what they've been able to do. But there's in the process of rescue, you know, they may be using their hands to pull down some of these um, concrete and the rest. Thereby, there may be other um, victims in there where 
this um, uh, concrete and the likes are being pushed to that can affect them and lead to their death as well. So that is why um, trained professionals are actually required. But in this case that we know that, yes, it's an emergency, neighbors, um, families, um, you know, emotions are high. Everyone tries to get in there. But what they should have done, if um, I were to advise it basically is, since they are just um, staffed, there are some basic duties that could be given to maybe site engineers, bricklayers, and some of the people on ground. They can assist while the trained personnel do the main job. That will help them to fasten and quicken the rescue process. I, I had never, I actually even forgot about the, the um, you know, proper gear and proper equipment for rescue because of the environment. It's filled with dust and, and cement and, and all of that. It makes it difficult to breathe. And so it must exactly. be even harder, you know, to, to do the job when you are dealing with breathing difficulties at the same time, um, which we obviously didn't, you know, think of taking care of because they don't have enough, you know, equipment and they're not properly um, uh, uh, dressed for kitted. search and rescue, kitted for search and rescue. Some other thing I want to, I want to ask about, um, in movies and from what we've seen, you know, elsewhere, we hear about the fire departments when there's a disaster like this, you know, they are first responders, the fire department, they rush there, they have their own search and rescue team or, you know, you know, branch rather of the fire department. Um, and we see these things play out very, very, you know, very interesting. Um, we don't have that here. What, what should you, would you expect from a local government like Etiosa? Um, you know, who, should it really be just La Sema dealing with a situation like this? Or should Etiosa itself, Etiosa local government area, have its own makeshift fire department or whatnot uh, that has all the equipment that you've mentioned, that should have its cranes, that should have its air ambulances, that should have its, its you know, um, whoever it is that is necessary and the equipment that are necessary for a situation like this. Is that what you should expect? Absolutely, yes. In fact, I was going to get to that because um, just like I'm still trying to use the Miami incident as an example because that was what happened recently. And when you look at the building, um, the structure somehow look alike, all right? And then the way it happened and the, the collapse also have similar model. Um, when you want to, when there's a collapse building and you want to make a rescue, only the emergency team, they like, such as the Lasema now, cannot do it. In fact, they are not meant to do it. Now, in safety and in HRC, as a matter of fact, dust is very, very flammable. Dust that you see is very, very flammable. Dust burns. So when there's such emergency, firefighters must be on ground. Because in the process of trying to rescue, you don't know if there are for example, thank God this is um, just um, this building is just still going up. There have not been electrical um, um, installations here and there yet. I don't think there was. So, if not, when, once this kind of thing happens and um, there is a spark from somewhere, there is this and that. There are some dust that burns. So, what that means is, once that happens, you on the surface you may not be able to see it because. Um, of the rubbles and the concretes and the rest that must have covered it. But those underneath these rubbles get to inhale um, this um, smoke, these uh, things that comes out of the uh, cables. And But when firefighters are around, because when they come, they don't just come with ordinary um, face, just as we have. They have, a lot of, they have a lot of gears that they put on. They have the half face mask. They have a, the full face mask um, with their air cylinder, um, some of them go to these kind of places with um, SCBA, that self-contained breathing apparatus. So once they are there, they have equipment that will be able, they also have smoke detectors. They have equipment that they deploy to this site and they'll be able to know if there is a leakage somewhere, there's a smoke, there's a fire underneath anywhere. So they don't work in isolation. When, when you look at the, the, the U.S. incidents, you see um, you see the police, the military men, you see the uh, the firefighters, you see the Red Cross, you see, so all these guys work together. In emergency rescue, only the emergency responders, they don't work in isolation. It's, it's meant to be um, a collaboration. As a matter of fact, I read, I think on Vanguard, that the military men, the Nigerian, the federal government um, mobilized some military engineers to site so that they can assist 
the Lagos State Government um, in trying to facilitate and fasten these rescue operations, but it was declined. So you see, yeah, and it's not meant to be so. This is meant to be a collaboration because only you cannot do it. Engineering is all about experience, and uh, is it's that. Mr. Adeko, what I'm yeah. another thing I'm trying to you know get you to speak on is you know what we would expect from um, not just Lagos State now, but at the local government level, would you expect that the the Etiosa local government should have these things readily available? Um, so we don't have to wait for um, rescue equipment to come from Mushi, because that's what the Lasema DG said to me, uh, that, you know, when a disaster happened, you know, their staff got there, you know, after, you know, a few minutes, I guess, but the equipment couldn't get there uh, till a couple of hours later because of traffic and the equipment were coming from Mushi. So would you expect that Etiosa should have these things readily available? They should have their own cranes, because you mentioned cranes. I don't think there were any cranes there. There were just excavators. And excavators are mostly used for demolition. If you looked at all the demolition videos, it's mostly as excavators that you see. Um, so should Etiosa have its own department, its own, if you want to call it a fire department, have a fire department that has a crane, that has any of these things ready and available? Absolutely, yes. You know, um, it's not just meant to be, um, these things are not just meant to be provided at the local government level. As in in developed um, world, up to world level, they need to have their own emergency plan and emergency team. Because, for example, something happened, maybe the local government um, sectorial or where this equipment are stationed happens to be in Ikoyi, and something happened in um, maybe um, Aja or Songotedo or any other place. You realize that for these equipment to get there, a lot of damages would have been done. So at the local government level, we are meant to have trained personnel that will be able to immediately respond to emergencies while more hands are being mobilized. Also, these equipments are supposed to uh, be provided for each of the local government. You are absolutely correct on that because you, don't, you can't be waiting for an equipment from motion when there's an emergency in Naja or when there's an emergency in Ekwe or when, when there's an emergency elsewhere. So they are meant to be provided for each local government and then each of this team need to be trained on the use of these equipment. Because like I said, even if provided, only the local government emergency responders may not be able to, uh, you know, to, um, yeah. to salvage the situation. But their immediate intervention would have saved a lot of things and a lot of life. And even the equipment provided, there were situations even in this, co uh, in this um, eco incident where incidents where um, the equipment broke down in many cases, running out of fuel. A lot of things that are not meant to be, actually. Nigeria is a big country. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things that are not meant to be. Anyways, um, there's also, I mean, for me as a person, I, I, I guess uh, we have been so carried away by the things we see in the movies and then the things we see in other countries, hoping to see that there would be some securing of the environment with the tapes and masking. And that's what you see when there's a crime scene or uh, you know, there's an emergency. So securing it, having those max tapes and all of that, so people do not trespass. But mostly, I don't think if um, that was really the case here. But another thing that was also uh, common as a practice was from time to time, there was releases of oxygen to the particular you know, environment where this thing happened, the release of oxygen and the release of water as well. Do you think that this is also a safety and a healthy practice for search and rescue? And even dogs. You may, want to, you may even want to talk about dogs and, you know, rescue, or search and rescue <laughs> dogs. Uh, I don't yes, think we have absolutely. any of, of that here. Yes, absolutely correct. First of all, you did talk about the, um, the safety tips, the caution tips. When an emergency happens, in order for you not to allow um, untrained personnel or untrained people to just rot into the site and try to um, engage in self-help, what you need to do is, we call it in HS, we call it cordoning. You need to cordon the place, all right? You need to use caution tape to cordon off the place and then allow only permitted and trained personnel to have access to the particular place. So when this happens, you know that you're already um, in charge of the situation. As a matter of fact, this particular cordoning of the, of the, um, of the environment must be left so until full investigation is done and completed, even after rescue operation. So that is that. Also, but in our case, you know, like I said, 
when you can't give what you don't have. Most of these personnel do not, either they do not have this training or they do not have this equipment available. Also, you talked about um, uh, pumping of air, oxygen and water to the scene. Absolutely correct. It's a safety practice. Reason being that, as I said earlier when I, when I began, when this kind of emergency happens, the person is more or less like in a confined space, all right? And in a confined space, when you are in that kind of place, you have limited access to oxygen, you have limited access to air, you have limited access to everything that makes you to breathe properly. So when you pump in oxygen, because there are cracks, because there are holes, they find their way into, uh, into underneath, if not completely, but to a very large extent. And once that happens, the strength of these victims that are struggling to survive get reinvigorated and then they, they, they begin to have their energy little by little. So when, once you do this, and as you do this, the, um, the rescue operation continues immediately while you try to call and wait for response. So you must at all times have these things in place because they help when you are there, when you are underneath that particular place where you have limited access to, um, to oxygen. What that means is that the hemoglobin of the red blood cells that, um, that passes this oxygen through your body and then gives you access to breathe and, and live fine will be denied this oxygen. And then that's what leads to suffocation and eventually you lose your breath. So it is actually a very good practice um, trying to, it doesn't save the whole situation, but it helps to in, um, in certain rescue operations. And also, like you said, the dogs, the sniffing dogs where you try to use it. Yes, these are things. The Miami situations, you see dogs here and there everywhere trying to, um, uh, to locate if, there, if there's human, if there's no human and all. So, but in our case, it has always been the same story. I did give an example of 2016, even before, 20, I mean 2014, even before then, there were collapses here and there. I gave an example of um, 2016, and even last year and this year, these things have become reoccurring decima. And like I also did say in the, um, um, at the beginning, we are a nation largely driven by emotions, but emotions are, um, active but short-lived so when things happen you see everyone cry everyone barks everyone this but after it we who follows it up to ensure that a policy is being put in place a policy um is being designed to ensure that these equipments are provided at local government level these personnel are well trained because emergency as an emergency responder you shouldn't just be an ordinary person you should be a field professional that understand the risks for example, when, as an emergency responder, if yours is um, for building collapse, because you, you have building collapse, you have a bomb terrorism and all that, you have all manner of, you have earthquakes and all that. If, based on your department, or if you are even for um, all of these rescues, you are meant to be trained, for example, as this building collapsed, what are the dangers, what are the risks that the cement, the blocks, and the environment uh, poses? The risks determine the kind of equipment that you go in there with. So, and as you get there, you're already equipped, you're already kitted, you'll be able to perform maximally. But when you don't have this training or you don't do not have this equipment, your marginal productivity will be low because your confidence level is low as you are working. You'll be telling yourself, remember, your family is waiting for you at home. When you breathe in these things in excess, you may collapse here, or when you get home, you may collapse. So because these are actually very, very um, hazardous dust and um, stuff that Ms. the Idoko. guys are exposed to. Ms. Idoko, um, in a sane society, what levels of incompetence and failure would you point out that the families of these you know, victims can sue the Lagos State Government or sue La Sema uh, for? Um, can you share with us, you know, the, the, the different levels of failure that you've noticed that should be enough for a class action lawsuit? Okay, um, like I said earlier, we have late time of response. When something happened by 1.30 a.m. where people are sleeping, there were um, immediate response to the rescue to ensure that, okay, they uh, move these guys out of that place and all. That is one. Two, 
Another failure, another um, failure is that of um, failure of, of equipment, not being able to provide the right equipment when they need um, a rules for these guys to be rescued. That is part of it. And then also the the excavator, the excavators that um, that we used or that was used. You know, you don't just use that for the for for few, for the few bodies that were dismembered in the cause of trying to um rescue you know it wasn't meant to be so you can't just what happened was basically more of retrieval and recovery rather than rescue because even the few ones remember the few ones that were rescued alive were um the ones that when the incident happened immediately and then maybe a few hours away but afterwards what we saw was just horrible so the excavators dismembering people and then all that it wasn't meant to be so this also boils down to um, the failure of the government to provide a requisite training to respond at the time because security, um, uh, securing lives and properties of every citizen is the sole responsibility of the government. Therefore, there can be, there can be well, I'm not a lawyer, but um, speaking from a um, safety perspective, it is a wrong practice because for every accident that you see, for every incident that you see, they are caused by either an unsafe act or an unsafe condition. So government not provide, not responding immediately by trying to come when, um, when the, uh, this thing happened within few minutes to uh, maybe at most an hour. An hour is even too much for a rescue operation to commence. Whereas we heard that this took over four hours before they arrived and all. So this is the failure of the government because when there's an unsafe act or an unsafe condition, you can be held liable for it. So the government, by not responding immediately, actually, the government, by not responding immediately, created an unsafe condition for these guys, for many of these guys not to survive. All right. Isaac Idoko, HS, uh, HSE manager at uh, Industry Safe Management Company Limited here in Lagos. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We, of course, uh, will keep the conversation going and hope that there is some clarity as to uh, what uh, happens next. Thank you for, uh, for your time once again. Good morning. All right. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, stay with us here on The Breakfast. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going to be moving into talking politics now, direct or indirect primaries. That's what comes up next.